get your first album. <laughs> or CD, I guess they're not albums anymore. So, Okay, I'm going to shoo you off now because we're getting going. I'm sorry, I know you have one more, but we... Sure. Okay, I'm sorry, but yeah, but thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Just a few housekeeping chores. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the schedule and you can see how we progress. Uh, we've got some really entertaining, I mean the first group was definitely entertaining and educational, this group will be too, but there's a couple people here that I think will uh, challenge maybe some assumptions you have. Uh, second thing is, if anybody is interested, and I'll ask one more time that the snow is gone, well at least it's not snowing, it's not gone gone, um, I'll ask at the very end, if anybody's interested to go down to the boathouse, uh, we've done that in the past. A uh, couple of the coaches go down, do some rigging, anything like that, show you the ergs. We have dynamics down there. Uh, we could talk about equipment, but that's all up to you. I know some of you have to jet, and I get that. Uh, but, so I'll leave that to you, and I'll ask you again uh, just be, before the end. The third thing is we have a, an evaluation in there to get your feedback. This is our fifth. This is Rowing Talks number five. We do this up for you, so we want to make sure that it is good for you. So please don't hesitate. We want you to be very, very candid on the, um, on the evaluations. On one side, for, that would be the one with all the, the text on it. That would be for you folks that, were, that are here today. For you folks that were here last night, we ran that special session in the night. Um, if you would flip it over and just give us your feedback on that one. We want to know what you really think in terms of should we have more vendors? We, we don't charge the vendors. We have the vendors come in to, to pass information, not only from them to you, but from you to them. Hope you have a, a, a chance to talk with. We have uh, several out there, so I hope you have a chance to talk with them. So we would like your feedback. Is that a good step for us to make this a better event? Are there other ways? How are the crab cakes? Okay, who ate two? Who ate at least two? Raise your hand if you had two. How about three? Keep the hands up. How about four? How about five? How about six? Ah, I win. Oh, seven? Get out. <laughs> I applaud you and your tenacity. Well done. <clears throat> OK, I do not know this person well, and yet I feel like I know her very, very well. One of our things that we try to do here is bring people in, female role models, people that are pushing the envelopes, people that have had challenges. For example, Rob Jones and, and Oksana Masters from last year. Go, overcoming huge challenges. By the way, Rob, I don't know uh, if you folks have been following him, he's riding his bike across country to raise awareness and funds for uh, disabled vets. And he's somewhere, bless his heart, out in Iowa. I believe that's the last. And, you know, bless him. You know, rock on, Rob. Um, and, but when I come back to this, I feel like I know her because talk about gutsy gals, talk about a gutsy person came from Winter Park, went to from Winter Park to? University of Washington. I've heard of that, right? <laughs> and rode there, uh, Cox in there, and then has just progressed on. I'm gonna let her tell the story. I don't wanna step on that, but here's somebody I, uh, really we met for the first time last night, but our holder in the highest regards, Caitlin Snyder. Yeah. Welcome, you get 30 minutes, whoopee. All right. So um, kind of what I want to talk to you guys about is just my journey um, and kind of how I started rowing and how I became a, a better coxswain and a better athlete through my experiences and also how my experiences coaching have helped me uh, you know, learn how to better develop my coxswains as athletes and uh, as coxswains on the water. So uh, I started rowing uh, my freshman year of high school uh, in Winter Park High School down in Florida. And I had broken my leg playing soccer twice. So soccer was kind of out of the question uh, for my high school sport. And my dad and I were looking at all the sports that Winter Park offered. And we're going down the list, talking about them. Um, and we see rowing. And he says to me, no, 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 that's too hard. You can't do that. You'll, you'll quit. It'll be too tough for you. So immediately, okay, I'm rowing. Like, I don't, if I don't like it, who cares? I'm gonna do it for four years. Like, I'll show you, Dad. Um, so I think we both won in that one. 
Um, so that was, that's how I started rowing. Uh, and then my junior year of high school, I started coxing. Uh, and I was terrible. I was the worst of the worst. Uh, my very first time on the water, I was coming into the dock really, really fast, and I knocked two riggers onto the dock way too quickly. Um, I ended up breaking the boat. We had to send it back to Vespoli. It was called the Mojo. So my nickname for the rest of high school was Mojo Killer. <laughs> and I cried and cried and cried, and somehow went back to practice the next day, and then you know, cried when the Mojo came back, and it was you know, then the 4V boat, and it was a real bummer. But got through it. So um, you know, I got better, I got a little bit better my senior year. Um, I was coxing the Varsity 8, and I wasn't really interested in rowing in college. Um, I had tried really hard to get recruited, and I just wouldn't hear back from coaches, or I would hear back, you know, well, we don't really recruit coxswains, or, you know, your grades aren't good enough, or, you know, whatever. And of course, I wanted to go to all the best schools, so, you know, that's probably why. But uh, I ended up applying to Bates College uh, in Maine, and I got accepted, and I was all ready to go. I even had a roommate, her name was Elizabeth. Um, so I was all, I was geared up, I was stoked, uh, and then my boat won the high school national championships, and you know, then of course everybody, everybody wanted us, uh, and my stroke seat got you know recruited by the UW coaches, and Mike Callahan said, you know, hey, do you think that anybody else from your boat wants to come as well? And he said, yeah, you know, maybe my coxswain wants to come. So I kind of hitched a ride on those coattails and ended up at UW, uh, which was awesome. I had a really great time. Um, and, you know, I just, I really quickly kind of realized that college rowing was a lot different than high school rowing. So how do I? You want me to oh, sure. Thanks. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, I went to UW. My freshman year was 2006. Um, I really thought I was the cat's meow. I just won nationals, you know, I was the varsity eight coxswain, you know, I thought our boat was so fast and so good. Uh, and I very quickly learned that that was not the case. Um, you know, I was surrounded by athletes that were on the Canadian junior national team, the US junior national team, uh, you know, and those were just the freshmen. And you know, some of the, the varsity athletes, one guy rode for Croatia for the Olympics, he'd like taken a year off of school. So I am just scared out of my mind. I have no idea what's going on. I feel like I'm nowhere near as good as all these athletes are, and I'm basically just trying to hold on for dear life. Um, one of the number one rules at Washington on the freshman team was don't ask questions. So I was really good at that. Didn't ask a single question. Um, I also didn't talk a whole lot. I was really scared every day of practice. Um, didn't want to get yelled at, and there was a lot of yelling. Um, so I was just really quiet. And you know, of course, during races, I'd you know cox my little heart out. But for practices, I was tense and scared and didn't say a whole lot. And you know, I think lucky for me uh, that might have come across as. You know, oh, I'm so smooth, and I know when less is more, but I mean, that was not true. <laughs> I, was, I was just really afraid. Um, so, so, you know, by stroke of luck, I ended up making uh, the freshman eight that year, and we did really well. We won the IRA, and I got an invite to the under-23 camp um, for the U.S. women. So... I didn't even know that there was a U23 team. And uh, Mary Whipple was working out of UW when I was there my freshman year. She was working with the women's team and she said, oh, you know, you should apply for this camp. Okay, you know, sure, I'll apply for the camp. I don't know what's going on, but if Mary Whipple wants me to do it, I will do it. So I did it. And I get to camp and it's basically just freshman year all over again, you know? Same thing happens. I, I just won the IRA. I think I'm so good and so awesome. Uh, and then I get to camp and I realize that I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. I don't have as much experience as everyone else. You know, these are girls that rode in varsity boats at top NCAA programs. Um, I was just the freshman coxswain. And 
I definitely felt really intimidated. Um, so it was kind of the same thing as freshman year all over again. Um, I didn't know what was going on at all. I didn't feel like I had any awareness of myself or my surroundings, but I showed up every day and I got in the boat a few times um, and I ended up making the team. And uh, actually, I didn't even have a passport when I went to U23 camp. Uh, that's how unaware I was. Uh, it was my first time ever going out of the country and it just didn't cross my mind that I might need a passport if I made the team. So I had to get it expedited and it worked out, but I mean, it just kind of goes to show I really didn't know what was going on. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm there, I'm along for the ride, I'm having fun. Um, we did really well and uh, I was lucky enough to get invited and, and make the team again in 2007 and 2008. Um, so that was a really great experience. And then of course, every year that I went back, you know, I, I felt a little more comfortable and, and things were a little bit easier for me uh, as an athlete. But definitely that first year was just everything over my head. Um, so we can fast forward to 2009. Ta -da. Um, I had just won the IRA with UW. Uh, and you know, this, I was a senior in 2009, so I definitely felt more comfortable at school. Um, I, I really felt like I had an idea of what I was doing, thought I was a pretty good coxswain. And then I get to senior camp in 2009, and ta-da, it's just like my freshman year again. I have no idea what's going on. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm getting all these rude awakenings over and over again. I don't know if you guys can kind of sense the trend here. Um, every time I think I've got it down, I realize that I have no clue what's going on. Um, so, you know, when I went to senior team camp uh, that year in 2009, there were six gold medal Olympians that were in the boat. Um, and that was really intimidating for me. So I'm kind of put in the situation where I need to immediately kind of like be the leader and, you know, take control. And I didn't feel comfortable in that position at all. Um, so for me, a lot of that summer was just trying to get to know the athletes, trying to get to know the coaches, trying to understand the technique, trying to understand the training. Um, but the majority of it was just kind of like fake it till you make it. Um, I was really, really scared all the time. And uh, I just kind of had to push through and get over my fear that, you know, all of these girls had so much more knowledge than I did. Um, just kind of sack up and get the job done anyway. So that was really hard for me. It was tough, um, but it was fun. I ended up making the team and we did really well. I was really lucky to be um, part of that boat with those girls that just had so much experience. So I learned a lot there for sure. Um, and I started, uh, I started, so I started learning more, and then um, in 2010, unfortunately, I didn't make the team. So I'm just absolutely crushed. I am devastated. I think that my Olympic dreams are over. Um, you know, I've been on the U.S. team, you know, under 23s for a few years. I make the senior team. I think I got it all going, and all of a sudden, you know, no, I'm not going to make it. I can't go to 2012. Uh, so I kind of had to think for a long time and realized that I didn't really have too many marketable skills outside of rowing. So I started coaching and I applied for tons and tons and tons of jobs. And uh, I was really lucky to get a position as the assistant coach at Loyola Marymount University uh, down in Los Angeles. And that's actually the marina. That's a real picture of the marina. So it's really foggy all the time. but. Uh, Anyway, so I'm, I'm working at LMU, um, and kind of the same thing happens to me again, uh, where I'm, I'm finding myself in this position that I'm very familiar with, where I don't know what's going on at all. Uh, so I, I really quickly realized that I didn't know a lot about the sport of rowing. I knew a lot about coxing, um, but I really didn't know a lot about rowing. Um, I, I understood the technique from the coxswain's point of view, but you know, watching rowing from the coaching boat and coaching rowing is way, 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 way different than, than coxing. 
So I, I quickly kind of learned that I didn't know what I was talking about, and I had to figure out what I was talking about if I was going to help you know, these girls at LMU get fast. Uh, and I actually loved it. I really, really enjoyed kind of discovering rowing from this, you know, the coaching perspective. And I feel like I learned so much more about the sport. And I was also really able to learn kind of what it was to be a good teammate and what it was to be a good leader. And I just remember, um, you know, it was like in the first month that I was there. I'm writing stuff on the board for practice and the coxswains are doing something annoying. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I would do every day. Like, no wonder my coaches would get so frustrated with me. Like, it was the biggest light bulb ever. And, you know, the coxswains continued to do annoying things for two years, uh, as all coxswains do and all rowers do. And I just, it was so eye opening to kind of realize, you know, those are the exact same things that I was doing wrong and I never realized it. And being able to see the team from another perspective, uh, I think really, really gave me an opportunity um, to grow as an athlete and grow as a teammate and grow as a leader. So I got really excited about rowing, kind of, you know, my, my reintroduction, I got really stoked again on rowing. Um, and I really wanted the opportunity to take all of these new things and these new ideas that I had discovered and try out for the team again. And you know, go back and be a better athlete on the water and be a better teammate and be a better leader and you know, take everything that I had learned from the girls at LMU and just kind of apply it to myself as an athlete. Uh, and I'm really fortunate that I was able to do that um, and I was able to try out for the team this summer. Uh, in 2013. And I chose this picture because this is really what coxing on the national team is all about. Um, it's the view from the launch. <laughs> so, uh, so we row the eight in the summer, um, but not every day. And when there's other coxswains at camp, you know, we rotate. So I'm in the boat in the eight like a couple times a week. Uh, and a lot of being on the national team as a coxswain is watching rowing from the launch. So in 2009, when I was there the first time, I hated it. I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know what I was watching. I, uh, you know, like I said, I didn't know what was going on. Um, but when I came back this summer, it was a whole new experience. And I loved being in the launch. I loved watching rowing. I loved listening to my coaches coach rowing and try and figure out if I could see what they were seeing, uh, try to figure out if I could see the changes. and. It became really fun for me, and you know, I feel really, really lucky that I had the experience to coach and then go back and row because it just made me so much better. It uh, made me appreciate everything so much more. So that's where I am now. Um, I'm on the team. I was on the team this summer, and you know, my goals for myself are just to continue to grow as an athlete and as a teammate and as a leader. Um, you know, make all of the boats on Team USA as fast as possible, um, win as many medals as we can, and you know, hopefully make the team for the 2016 Olympics. Um, so we'll see how it goes, but uh, I'm definitely really fortunate to uh, have been able to have all of these eye-opening experiences where you know, I think I'm the bee's knees and then I get cut down. And somehow I just kept thinking over and over, oh yeah, I, I won this race, I'm so good now. You know, oh, now I've got it figured out, now I've got it figured out. Um, and I think one of the most important things I learned is that I don't have it figured out. And in order for me to continue to grow as an athlete or as a coach, uh, you know, as a coxswain, it's kind of accepting the idea that I don't know everything. And you know, finally when I was able to accept that, um, that's when I really started to grow and when my growth started to just kind of skyrocket. Um, and that was exciting for me and it took so many, <laughs> as you guys saw, you know, year after year, it took so many times of, of you know, thinking I was great and kind of having it not be the case um, for me to really realize that it's all about you know, accepting that I don't know everything and in, in accepting that I'm really able to absorb information. 
So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm really excited to continue training with the team and hopefully one day continue coaching and just try and suck up everything that I can. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's, I mean, so that's who I am as a coxswain. And um, so something that I really wanted to kind of talk to you guys about is, um, you know, obviously like, I learned a lot about myself through uh, all of these experiences, but I also think that I learned about what it means to be a good coxswain. And I think I learned through coaching how to kind of coach these coxswains to become better athletes and better teammates themselves, hopefully without having to have so many, you know, like, oh shit moments like I had. Uh, so, so one thing, um, one thing that I want to talk to you guys is about is the, you know, kind of the myth of, of coaching coxswains, and that is, you know, I don't know how to coach coxswains. I was never a coxswain. I don't know how to coach them. I don't know what to tell them. Uh, you know, go figure it out yourself, kind of. And to be honest with you, when I started coaching, I almost felt that way. And that's, and I was a coxswain. And I was like, I don't know, you guys, just, it's common sense. Like, come on, let's just get, get it together, all right? Uh, and it took me a while of, of trying to work with them to realize, like, no, they, it's not common sense. Uh, and it took me years <laughs> to try and figure out how to cox. So, you know, maybe I need to change my strategy a little bit. Um, and when I got down to thinking about it, I kind of realized that as coaches, we are coaching the coxswains every day. Um, I guarantee you guys that you're telling all your coxswains exactly what you want them to do on a daily basis at practice. Uh, so the question then becomes, why are they not listening? Why are they still horrible? You know, like, okay, cool, I'm coaching them every day. Like, well, then what's, you know, why is there still a problem? Um, I think, at least, you know, f through my experience, it's been really important to kind of change the culture of what it means to be a coxswain on your team. Um, I think that you know you tell your coxswains what to do every day, and they're not listening. Uh, you know you tell them, "I want you to focus on steering straight. I want you to get the boats level. I want you to call this drill. I want you to stay on rate." There's like a million and a half logistical things that you're telling them every day, and they're not listening. And instead, they're focused on, you know, making really awesome technical calls and fixing the problems in the boat. And they're focused on motivating the rowers and what does everyone want to hear that's going to pump, you know, what's going to get everyone pumped up. Uh, they're focused on, you know, the magic calls. Whatever the magic calls are, I don't know, but everyone wants to figure it out and everyone wants to use them all the time. So as much as you're telling them what to do, it's going in one ear, out the other, and they're kind of doing what they want. So maybe, you know, at least in my experience, it's really hard to get the coxswains to understand, you know, what you guys want to do and what you think is important doesn't matter. You need to be in the right place at the right time. You need to steer straight. You need to be on rate. You need to call the drills. You know, when we're making pair switches and I say, switch the pair every 20 strokes, you can't wait 40 strokes. You just can't do it. And they don't, I just, for some reason, they don't understand that. Um, so I thought about it a lot. And, you know, in, in working with my coxswains, I've kind of, realize that the most successful way to make them listen is to kind of just change the culture of the coxswains on the team. Um, so I think that it's really important when you're teaching people how to cox um, that you make sure they understand that coxswains are teammates first above anything else. Um, it would be awesome if your coxswains can participate in all of the land workouts. Um, I know like sometimes people have injuries. I actually can't run right now, um, but I'll try to get on the bike you know, if you know, we're doing something long and boring and I have time to do so. Um, you know, but all the coxswains need to be there during the land workouts. They need to be participating if they can. Um, I think especially in high school, that becomes so important when you're trying to build this team dynamic to have everybody doing the same thing. 
Uh, I was coaching the Coxons at Mercer Juniors this fall, and the Coxons would just kind of like walk around in a group, like a little Coxon posse, and you know, oh no, we don't need to be doing, yeah, we don't need to do this warm up, we're Coxons. Like, oh no, we don't need to be, you know, at this erg practice because we're Coxons. Okay, yes, you do need to be doing it because you're Coxons, you know, you have a hard enough time trying to get the respect of your teammates because you're not actually pulling on an oar. So that's all the more reason why you need to be doing the warm up and going on the runs. And if they're erging and you can't erg or there's not enough ergs or you're recording scores, then it needs to be done silently with respect to the people who are working out. So I've also seen coxswains that are, you know, dancing in the corner because, you know, the cool music is playing when they're doing ergs. You know, people are chatting or texting on their cell phones or, you know, working on homework. Um, and as much as you can, I think it's so important to make sure that the coxswains are present at practice, participating if they can. And if not, then they can sit there and watch quietly, boringly. But that's okay. It's just as boring for everyone who's working out. So it's, it's a perfect. Um, I think it's also really important not to separate your coxswains from the rest of the team. So they should never be privy to, you know, like top secret practice information. Um, girls on the national team all the time say, you know, Caitlin, do you know what we're doing for practice tomorrow? Do you know, you know, when we're going to be doing the pieces next week? I'm like, no, I don't know. And everyone's like, well, you're the coxswain, you should know. Like, no, like, I'm the coxswain and you're the rower and we're teammates and we're equal and like, I know what you know. Um, and I think that that's really important on a team. And I know, uh, especially when you have limited resources and you need to delegate, uh, it can be easiest to delegate to the coxswains. Uh, but if you can, you know, try to make sure that you're not separating them from the rest of the team, that everyone has the same information at the same time, um, that when you do delegate things, you know, sometimes it's a coxswain, sometimes it's a varsity rower, you know, they're trying to make it so that everyone's equal, everyone's one team, coxswains, rowers, we're all the same. Um, I also think that it's really important not to have a rower vote when you're choosing your coxswain. Um, so I think that, you know, at least one, once I got to college and on the US team, I think that the rowers and the coaches are all more on the same page with, uh, you know, what, what's important in a coxswain. Uh, but at the high school level especially, um, it's a lot harder. <laughs> You know, the, the kids, the rowers, don't really know what a good coxswain is all the time. They don't really, you know, maybe the rowers are the ones that want all that motivation and all those technical calls, and, and the rowers want all those things that you're telling your coxswain aren't important. So what happens is, um, you know, and I, and I saw this when I was coaching junior athletes, is you're kind of, you put the coxswains in the situation where they can't please everybody. So, you know, you're yelling at them to do one thing, but if they know that the rowers are going to be voting on their selection, then the default is to do whatever the rowers say. Please the rowers, you know, those are the ones that are voting on me, you know, and, and no matter how hard they, you know, they try to say, no, 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 it's, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do what the coach says, not what my stroke seat says, uh, it never happens that way, ever. So I think the easiest way to kind of Make sure that your coxswains are 100% zoned in on you and what you want as a coach um, is just to take out the voting aspect of it. Um, you know, that's not to say like you shouldn't pull aside a rower that you trust and ask them, you know, what do you think of, you know, Sally and Susie on the water. But I would really try to eliminate the voting process um, if for no other reason than it's just going to help you get your coxswains to do exactly what you want and have a singular focus on executing what the coach wants to do. Um, I think that, so that's, so, you know, so that's 
I think how you can help your teammates or how you help your coxswains become better teammates. Um, and I think the really important part uh, is also helping them build their base fitness. So your rowers are building their base fitness during the year. And for the coxswains, uh, the base fitness is really just the basics and executing the logistics. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. Those are sometimes the things that they don't want to do. Um, and it's really important for you to ingrain in their minds that coxing is about the basics. Coxing is about the basics. Motivation doesn't matter. You know, the coxswain should not be somebody who is throwing out technical calls left and right and trying to fix the problems in the boat. You can fix the problems in the boat as a coach. You want your coxswain lining up, being in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, something I would always tell my coxswains is like, you guys, I'm going to push you off the dock at WCCs, like our conference championship. And if I don't trust you to get to the line on time, and I don't trust you to run through the race warm up, then you're not going to be racing. Like, I, I, I can't be out there you know, making sure that you're saying this or not saying this, making sure that you are there, you know, two minutes before the start. So if you can't show me in practice that you are 100% devoted to executing, then you can't race in my boat because you need to be giving these girls the best opportunity that they have, and that is logistics. So really just nailing home how important that is for your team. Um, one of my greatest learning moments of all time was at the University of Washington. Uh, I think it was in the fall of my junior year. My coach decided that all coxswains were going to stop talking for four weeks. So, so I was like, what are we going to do? I mean, it's, it's over. I'm done. <laughs> so we were allowed to call the rate, and we were allowed to call like pair switches. But that's it. Um, you know, and then, you know, get the boats level. But that's it. Four weeks. So, and we did race pieces, too. And I was convinced that my boat was going to fall apart, that, you know, we weren't going to get anything done in these four weeks. So this is so useless. Like, you know, I'm the varsity cox, and I should be allowed to talk. I know what's going on. Like, you know, these guys need my help, this and that. Everything was fine. Nobody needed my help. The boat didn't get any slower probably got a little bit faster, like everything was fine. And I was just humbled and I said, okay, now I get it. You know, everyone survived. And it wasn't just a day, it wasn't, it was four weeks. And, and everything went on as if, you know, I was that unimportant. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's okay. It, it definitely helped teach me um, that less really is more sometimes. Um, and I think that when you, you know, when you can get someone to kind of stop talking as much and, and focus on the logistics, uh, that's when you can really develop coxswains that are, you know, increased awareness. Uh, they become better at steering. Uh, they learn more about technique. So. Now that you mentioned stopping talking. I think I that's it, actually. <laughs> is there, you have one last thing? I think that I'm pretty much done. I was just going to say... Um, that make sure that you emphasize the basics. I already said that. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, I, I think that, I think that uh, you know, when you're building the culture of coxswains that are, are listening to you instead of the rowers, that that's when you uh, develop kids that are going to be you know, more valuable to your team. How about, how about a question? Well, well Coach Blackman gets ready. A question? Anyone for Caitlin? Uh, now that you've coached on the international level, what's your viewpoint? rowing as compared to the way the United States does? I think that there are many different ways to skin a cat. Um, and it's, I, I really like going, you know, watching races internationally because there are some countries that just, they look like they row terribly, but for some reason they can get, you know, they can cross the finish line first. Um, and then there's, all, there's lots of different techniques, different styles, and, you know, somehow people find all different ways to be successful. And I think that's the coolest part.
So Caitlin's going to stay for a while and then Q and A. So yeah, definitely. Deeper, if you want to. Thank you so much. Thank you.